Hey everybody, welcome back to RSP, and you know what this means. That's right, we're playing Nemesis again. So in this video, I'm going to break down the Void Seeders and the turrets. If you are unfamiliar with this box, it is the Kickstarter stretch goals box that came with the original campaign. It includes an alternate alien race called the Void Seeders and an expansion called Aftermath, which contains a bunch of sort of modular bits, including new characters, a new game mode, a bunch of sort of new rooms and functions that you can add to the game as well. And you can include as much or as little of that as you like. But what I'm going to be focusing on in this video are the Void Seeders, which is the alternate alien race. The Void Seeders are essentially just these layers scattered throughout the ship, creating waves of psychic influence that create maddening hallucinations of aliens in escalating degrees of horror. With the most terrifying being this creature called the Despoiler. I'm going to run you through the components for the Void Seeders expansion. Basically everything you need to play with the Void Seeders. I'm going to go through the setup and the rules for the Void Seeders expansion. And as a little bonus, I'll cover the turrets as well. As usual, you can find all of the sections of this video in the description down below. This will help you get an idea of the layout of the video and help you find any specific rules you might be looking for. But without further delay, let's board the Nemesis again. I'm going to go through now all of the components you need to play with the Void Seeders. This is not a comprehensive rundown of everything in the stretch goal box, but just the stuff you need to implement the Void Seeders into your games at home. So let's take a look. You might notice as well that I got the, uh, the old uh, wash there. So we've got six of these lurkers here who replace creepers. The most basic of the alien creatures. We've got four whisperers who replace adults. We've got one stalker who replaces the breeders and one despoiler who replaces the queen. You'll notice that there are no larvae for the Void Seeders. We've also got three layers, which are these little things here. We've got one Void Seeder board. We've got 17 of these Void Seeder tokens here, and you'll notice that these are unlike the intruder tokens from the original set, because they have warnings on both sides. 17 different ones of those in addition to a blank token, just like in the intruder set. And we've also got these character insanity tokens, one for each character color in the game. We've also got three exploration tokens with layers on, which are critical to the setup of the Void Seeders game. We've got 20 Void Seeder attack cards, which replace the attack cards from the original game. 20 Void Seeder event cards, which replace the event cards from the original game. 20 panic cards, which are a new thing. 5 Void Seeder help cards. And some insanity track cards as well. And 8 Void Seeder weakness cards. And the rest of the stuff we need to play with the Void Seeders will come from the Nemesis core set box. So, let's get stuck into the setup of the Void Seeders expansion. So we're going to set up the Nemesis ship, get it ready to fly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through the setup and I'm going to point out the changes where they're distinct from what happens in the original core set. So in this video, I'll set up a two player game, but as we know, that only really impacts the number of escape pods I'm going to put out. So of course we've got our Nemesis board and that's the first thing we're going to put out. We know that this is double sided with a easier side and a harder side, but we're actually going to put out the easier side, which is the one with just the red um, service tunnels on it. So this is the basic side of the board. As we know, the other side contains a more advanced, more 
difficult side. When we're setting up the Void Cedar game, we're instructed to use this side. So then we can move on to the rooms, and what we're going to do is we're just going to go into the number two rooms here and take out the slime room. So we'll go into the number two rooms here and take out the slime room because Void Cedars don't have slime. All right. And then you can shuffle the rest of the ones and the twos and put them out as per the normal setup. So now that we've got all our rooms out, we're going to do exploration tokens. So we've got 20 exploration tokens in the original Nemesis core set. What we're going to do is we're going to take out the two covered in slime because they're irrelevant. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the three layer exploration tokens from the Void Seeders expansion. We're going to add to that 13 random exploration tokens from the original set to create a pool of 16. And then we're going to randomly assign them to all the rooms on the board. So that's the main change with exploration tokens. Just make sure you take out the slime and put in the layers and make sure all three layers are on the board because in the core set, obviously, it's just put out 16 random ones and don't worry about it. We're going to put out a random coordinates card, which is business as usual. We're going to grab one of our status markers and put it on B, which is business as usual. So we'll put out our escape pods next. Remember, it's two escape pods for one or two players, three escape pods for three or four players, and four escape pods, all four escape pods with five players. And so remember, we put them out on their locked side, and we fill up with uh, A1, then B1, then A2, then B2. So fill them up in order. Next, we'll do the engines, which is just like the base game. So just shuffle your engine tokens. So there's a random one on top, and stick them in the three engine rooms. And then we'll set up the Void Cedar board with five eggs in the nest and three weakness cards on it. We can put the remaining Void Cedar weakness cards back in the box because we won't be using them in the game. And then we'll set up our Void Cedar bag. We're going to put in the blank token, two random warning tokens, so you just got to try not to look at these. Now remember these are different from the intruder ones because they don't have an alien type on them. They have just got a warning number. So we'll put in two random ones of those, and then two additional random tokens per player. So because I'm setting up a two-player game here, I'm going to take four more random tokens from the stack and get those in there. One, two, three, four. We'll do more with this later on. But for now, put it to one side. So we'll just shuffle the Void Seeder attack deck and the Void Seeder event deck and just put them out on the table somewhere where someone can reach them to use them. We'll put out the panic deck as well, that's a new thing, so just give that a shuffle and put that out too with the other two decks. And then we're going to set up decks from the base set which are the same, so we're going to set up the contamination cards, the serious injury cards, we'll do the three item decks, the crafted items, and the scanner as well. So here are the contamination cards, and there are the cards from the core set. And so now we need to get out the tokens. We've got our doors, our alien corpses. We only actually need three alien corpse tokens for the Void Seeder expansion. We've got our blue human corpse token, although I don't know why we need that, because it's irrelevant for this expansion. We've got noise tokens, malfunction tokens, and fire tokens as well. That's the same. You take your blue human corpse token, put it in the hibernation chamber. The three alien corpses just go off to one side because we'll, we'll use the alien carcasses later. You're also going to need the four dice, the ammo and wound tokens, the clear status markers, and of course the first player marker as well. Don't forget to put one of the clear status markers on the first round of the game spot there on the long tracker. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get one help card per player. I'm setting up a two player game, so I'll get two help cards. I won't need the rest. So we'll get two of the Void Seeder help cards, which have come in the stretch goals box. We'll get the inventory holders as well. I've got one and two because I'm setting up a two player game, but one per player. So next we're going to start off our player setup by dealing each player a help card. You will take help cards equal to the number of players you have in the order. So I'm setting up a two player game, so I'm just going to use the one and two player help cards and the rest I don't need. And then each player will be dealt one of these and take the appropriate numbered inventory holder. 
and they'll get uh, a Void Seeders help card to go along with that as well. And so once you've got your personal and your corporate objective, you can just hang on to those for now. So then we'll do the character draft, wherein player one draws two cards off the top of the deck and decides which character they want to take, and player two then does the, the same thing. So player one will draw two cards off the top of the deck, they'll look at them in secret, decide which character they want to be, and then the character will get shuffled back into the deck. Player two will draw two, decide which one they want to be in secret, shuffle the other one back into the deck, and the character draft is complete. So now our players will reveal which characters they took. So we've got the pilot and the soldier. And here's the first change. We're going to grab the colored tokens associated with those characters. And we're going to add them to our intruder bag. Once you've done that, you can put the remaining insanity tokens back in the box because you won't need them this game. You can give the starting player marker to player one as well. So as per the regular setup of the game, each character gets their deck of 10 action cards, which they'll shuffle, and they're going to draw five from. We've got our starting piece of equipment here, which is the assault rifle for the soldier. And that starts with the ammo five, so put five ammo on there. We've got our two starting quest items, and they start face down. And the last thing we're going to do for player setup is that we're actually going to put out a insanity track here on our player board. We're going to cover up the miniature in the slime spot because we don't need those for this game. We still might need to send the signal though depending on our objective. And then we're going to grab one of these status markers and put it on the number one space there like that. And so now that we've got our characters all set up with their insanity tracks and their equipment and we've got our first player marker out here, the last thing I'll do of course is put the pilot and the soldier in the hibernatorium because of course they're the two heroes we're playing with in this game. And now that we've got our characters all set up on the ship and everything else ready to go, we're ready to start playing Nemesis the Void Seeders. Welcome back to the Nemesis. Bad news, folks. It's been infested by Void Seeders. Void Seeders are an enigmatic alien race that target the minds of others. They send visions to their prey, driving them to acts of madness that ultimately cause them to destroy themselves. The Void Seeders are mostly inert things like layers and eggs, but they create these horrifying visions in order to protect themselves. As the presence of the Void Seekers insidiously invades your mind, you'll be visited by terrifying visions of lurkers, whisperers, stalkers, and the most horrifying Void Seeder of them all, the protector of the lairs, the despoiler. And although these things are just visions and mad hallucinations, the damage that you can do in your panicked state is all too real. So the Void Seeder expansion makes a number of changes to the game, although primarily what it does is it adds this insanity track, which is a mechanic used to manifest this idea that you're losing your mind and being visited by these horrifying things. We've got this all new panic deck here that's going to help us to realize that effect as well. And so you can see that the panic actually covers up the slime, so there is no slime in the Void Seeders expansion either. And anything that refers to slime is just ignored. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through these main changes in the order I think makes the most sense. We're going to start by looking at the insanity track, and then we're going to talk about encounters. Then we'll talk about the alien types and how to fight them. Then we'll talk about layers, and then we're going to talk about panic cards. And then there's a few extra bits at the end to talk about, like, contamination at the end of the game. And finally, after that, we'll do the bonus bit about turrets. So we're going to start with the main new mechanic, the insanity track. So each character has an insanity track here which you'll notice has five different levels, arrows connecting them. Note specifically that the one between two and three is different. More on that later. We've also got this little symbol up here, which sort of stands for character sanity in the game. The symbol will come up with things that are pertinent to this mechanic. As you go more insane over the course of the game, you'll move your status marker up these different rungs on the track. But once you hit insanity level three, you can never go back to two. So anything that would move you back down this track and improve your sanity can never get you below three once you've gotten to three. That's why there's no backward arrow on the one here. If you ever hit insanity level five and you're instructed to go up again, you are driven totally mad and effectively you're dead. You're dead, you're out of the game. 
You die instantly, in fact. There are two different ways to gain insanity. When you're instructed to resolve a panic card and you can't, you gain one insanity. And if you have a contamination card that turns out to be infected, you go straight to level five. There are a few ways to reduce your insanity so that you can avoid going up to five and being driven totally insane. But remember, once you hit three, you can never go back to two or one. So if you craft an antidote, that will allow you to go back down one in addition to the text on the card. If you take a rest action, the rest action will allow you to go down one as well. If you use the shower room or the canteen, these also reduce your insanity by one. But remember that you can check your contamination cards at this time. If you check your contamination cards and one of them is infected, you'll go back up to five. And this happens after you reduce your insanity. So it is a risk and you might wind up worse off than where you were when you started. You can also use a surge reaction to go back to three. So if you're on four or five, the surge reaction will move you back to three. That's instead of removing a larva because there are no larva in this game. Remember, we didn't have any larva in the setup. And also we've covered up the miniature icon here so there's nowhere to put the uh, larva on our player board either. But I'll put those modes of reducing your insanity up on screen now so you can check them. Just remember about checking your contamination cards. Remember the infected card puts you up to five insanity. So now that we've talked about how you go up and down the insanity track, let's talk about encountering a Void Seeder. So remember, an encounter happens when you roll the noise die and you would have to put noise out into a corridor that already has a noise token. Womp womp. So remember, when you have an encounter, you collect all of the noise tokens and return them to the pool. And then you go into the intruder bag and draw out a token from the bag. In this case, we've drawn a intruder token or a void seeder token, but this one has no alien type on it. It's just got warning level two. So we've also got in the bag these character insanity tokens and the blank token's still in there. Hooray! So if you draw a character insanity token from the bag, then the first thing you have to do is put noise in every corridor connected to the room of the character that triggered the encounter. So we'd have to put the noise back out and then that character would have to resolve a panic card. Now note that in this instance, the soldier has drawn the insanity token that belongs to the pilot. But when we're resolving an encounter, we just ignore the color on the token and resolve the, all of these tokens the same way. So any character who draws this token for an encounter, noise out in every corridor and then resolve a panic card. And we'll talk about how those work later on. Finally, the token goes back into the bag. If you drew the blank token, it works the same way as drawing the blank token in the regular game. Noise out in every corridor. And then the blank token goes back into the bag. Finally, if you drew the Void Seeder token with the warning on it, then what you're going to do is you're going to check the insanity track on your player board. So the insanity track will tell you what kind of Void Seeder to put out. As you can see, we've got the Lurkers down here. We've got the Whisperers at level 2 and level 3. At level 4, we'll put out a Stalker. And at level 5, we'll put out the Despoiler. Our Soldier has Insanity level 3, so we're going to put out one of the Whisperers. Whenever you're called upon to spawn a Void Seeder, and you don't have the miniature available, for example, maybe the stalkers on the board and somebody of insanity level four has an encounter, you always use the next miniature down. We're also gonna check the warning level. Remember that if you have equal to or greater cards in hand, you don't have to suffer a surprise attack, but if you have fewer cards in hand than the warning level, you suffer a surprise attack. Void Seeder surprise attacks work the same way for all Void Seeders. So it doesn't matter whether it's a stalker or a lurker, or the despoiler who's shown up. All surprise attacks work the same way. First, you have to take a contamination card and put it in your discard pile, and then you have to resolve a panic card. After you've resolved any surprise attack, if it happens, take the Void Seeder token here and just put it back into the general supply near the Void Seeder board. 
Well, now we seem to have a Whisperer on the board. We might as well look at the Void Seeders and how to fight them. So obviously we've got four different kinds of Void Seeders here. We've got the Lurkers, who are the smallest and least threatening. The Whisperers, who are the most common. We've got the Stalker here, who is pretty fearsome. And the Despoiler, which is a whole nother level. We've also got these layers, which might come out onto the board if you discover them in a room. And you will be looking for these. They're really important, and we'll discuss those in a minute. Functionally, attacking a Void Seeder works exactly the same way as attacking an Intruder. So you'll be able to do a melee attack or a shooting attack. You spend ammo, you roll your attack die, you deal damage if you roll the pertinent symbol. So you've got the same exact symbols with the same exact ratios as the regular intruders. And if you deal damage, you'll draw Void Seeder attack cards to see what happens. The main difference is how the different levels of Void Seeders take damage. So you've got your Lurker here, who's the basic enemy, and the Lurker will draw two cards and check those cards. Now, if either card shows the retreat symbol, the Lurker retreats which means you remove it from the board and put a random Void Seeder token into the bag. If you don't draw a retreat symbol, then check both numbers for the Lurker and use the lower number. So in this case, two injuries to kill it. If you're fighting a Whisperer like in the example here, just draw one card and resolve it for the one card that you drew. If you're fighting the Stalker, draw two cards. If either one shows retreat, it retreats. And uh, just like the intruder, you take it off the board, and you put a random Void Seeder token into the bag. If neither card shows retreat, then resolve one card, but take the higher number. And then there's the Despoiler. The Despoiler is invincible and cannot receive injuries under any circumstances. However, it might be worth shooting it, because if you do happen to hit the Despoiler, then you can still draw a card to see if it retreats. Dang it, it didn't retreat. But wait a minute, how do we kill the despoiler then? Well, that's a very good question, and we'll need to know all about layers. We're gonna talk about layers in a minute, but before we do that, let's just remember that uh, when you do kill a Void Seeder, just remove the miniature from the board, and of course, put a token back into the intruder bag. Because Void Seeders are actually horrifying hallucinations, you don't put an alien carcass token onto the board. Additionally, let us remember that Void Seeders, because they're hallucinations, they can ignore doors. So if you're trying to run away from one and you're going to close a door behind you because you think that's going to protect you, it doesn't. They can move right through those doors. They ignore them completely. So let's talk about layers. So our soldier here is gonna enter this room here, and it turns out it's a lair. We're gonna grab one of these lair tokens and put it out into the room. And there are a few things we should note when we discover a lair on the board. So the first thing to note is that the soldier has entered a room which now has a miniature in it, which means he doesn't have to roll for noise for entering this room. So that's good, I guess. However, this is a miniature, so we are now in combat, and this will affect certain cards and equipment that the soldier might want to use. He's considered in combat, so long as he's in a room with a lair. And lairs are actually physical things. Unlike the other Void Seeders, which are crazy hallucinations, lairs are actually physical things, which means they drop alien carcasses. This is the only way to find carcasses in the game with the Void Seeders, is to destroy a lair. This is why I had us only put out three tokens during setup. So if we take a quick look at the Void Seeder board over here, we see that there are three weaknesses. We've got the egg weakness, the carcass weakness, and we've got something called character insanity level weakness. Well, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute, but as we can see the carcass weakness, the only way to get a carcass is by destroying a lair. But there is an additional benefit to destroying a lair, and this is really important. The lair is the Void Seeder's only weak point, so you want to destroy these ASAP. However, because they are their only weak point, they have this weird, like, psychic call that they're going to send out. So every time a player ends a round in a room with a lair, you must roll for noise. 
Remember that a round in Nemesis is after you've had the opportunity to play two cards from your hand. This is the only time in the game where you count as being in combat and still roll for noise. In order to destroy the lair, you'll need to attack it. You can do either a melee attack or you can shoot it. Remember, if you do a melee attack, it could result in contamination. And if you shoot it, you need anything, anything but a blank in order to hit it. And if you hit it, it takes wounds based on the attack, of course. So you might be able to do more than one. And then you draw two cards. So if either card shows the retreat symbol like we see here, then the lair is not destroyed. If the retreat symbol is not shown, then you go with the higher card. And if you have done wounds equal to or greater than the higher number, the lair is destroyed. We remove the lair from the board and we put it here onto the destroyed lair position on the void cedar board. Layers can't move in any way, so once they're on the board, they're there until they're destroyed. When you destroy a layer, put an alien carcass token in the room. And once you've destroyed all three layers, the despoiler counts as defeated, and you can remove that miniature from the game. This also works for completing the Great Hunt personal objective. And additionally, if you're at insanity level 5, but you've destroyed all three layers, because the despoiler model's been removed from the game, you'll attempt to spawn the stalker, and if you can't, you'll spawn a whisperer instead. So you always drop a rung down. So taking the despoiler out of the game in this way, extremely useful. I would also point out that if a lair happens to be in a yellow room, and you've discovered the airlock control room, you can actually vent the lair into space using the airlock control procedure. But if you do this, then you don't put out an alien carcass token because the thing's in space. So now you know how to discover alien carcasses and now you know how to fight the Void Seeders. Let's talk about these weakness cards. If you remember how alien weaknesses work from the core game, then you pretty much know everything you need to know already. You've got to find the laboratory somewhere on the board, which is one of the level one rooms. So around the outside in this case. And you've got to take either an alien carcass, which is a heavy item that you'll have to pick up and carry to the laboratory and analyze. Of course, in this game, it's slightly more difficult to find an alien carcass. You also need to find the nest. Oh, look, it's here. And once you've found the alien nest, you can go in there and pick up an egg. And if you can grab an egg, you can take that to the laboratory and analyze it to get an alien weakness. When you discover a void seed or weakness, you just flip that card face up. It works exactly the same way as in the core set. And every void seeder is then affected by that card moving forward. The one difference is this character insanity level. So as you can see here, we've got a weakness called character insanity level, which is a bit different to the character corpse weakness that you find in the core game. So if you remember, when uh, we put out this blue character corpse token during setup, I said this is a bit useless in this game, and that's because this is different. So unlike in the core game where you would analyze a character corpse, in this game when you get to the laboratory, you have to analyze a character who has reached level 3 insanity or greater. And characters can analyze themselves. So if our soldier here is at insanity level 4 and finds his way into the laboratory, then he can use the laboratory action to analyze himself, and that will uncover this Void Seeder weakness. But that's it for alien weaknesses. So now that we've covered their physiology, let's talk about their behavior, because there are a few changes to the event phase, which is when the Void Seeders do things. So there are two main changes to the event phase in the Void Seeder expansion. The first is the lurking step, which is a new step that's been added. And additionally, there are some changes to bag development, because the bag is different now. So after resolving the event card, and before going into bag development, you do this new step called the lurking step. So when you do the lurking step, what we're looking for here are rooms that contain one or more void seeders that do not contain a player character and are not neighboring a room that contain a player character. Note that when we talk about void seeders in the lurking step, we do not include layers in that. Layers are distinct. So. First, we've got here, for example, one Void Seeder, but they're in a room with a soldier. 
We've got another void seater here, but it's adjacent to the room containing the pilot, so they're both disqualified. However, we've got one void seater here in the canteen, and there's no player characters in adjacent rooms either. So this void seater is going to go into lurking, and what that means is we take the void seater miniature off the board, and then we place noise in every corridor adjacent to that room. And then we grab one random void seater token and put it into the bag. And this is because, of course, they're all scary hallucinations and nightmares, and out of sight, out of mind, right? Except, of course, they leave behind a lot of threat for you to deal with. So the second change to the event phase is, of course, bag development. So bag development works just the same as the base set in the sense that you go into the bag and draw out a token. But you might draw a character insanity token. So in this case, we've drawn the pilot's token, and color matters. Unlike in the encounter step, now color matters. So our pilot here is going to have to resolve a panic card. Uh-oh. If our pilot had died, or had gone into hibernation, or escaped, for whatever reason they're out of the game, and we draw their token from the bag, we just remove it from the game and draw another token instead. But our pilot's still in the game, so once they've resolved their panic card, we'll put the token back in the bag. If we were to draw the blank token during bag development, then we would just take another random void seater token and put it into the bag. And if we draw a void seater token during bag development, then we have to roll for noise for every character who's not in a room with a void seater. And so in this case, our soldier wouldn't roll for noise, but our pilot would have to. Remember that this also includes characters in combat, so anyone in the room with the lair here would not have to roll for noise. And of course that goes back into the bag. So that's everything you need to know to get through the event phase. And uh, remember that your bag development is handily on your Void Seeders help card as well. So you can remember what all those tokens do when you pull them out the bag. So we've heard a lot about them. The panic cards, let's look at a panic card and how they are resolved. Panic cards represent how your characters deal with their increasing insanity and how they deal with the situation going on around them. You're going to draw a panic card under basically four different situations. When a Void Seeder surprise attacks you, when you pull any insanity token from the bag as a result of an encounter, when your color insanity token is pulled from the bag during bag development like we just saw, or as the result of certain event cards. Now, when you draw a panic card, you flip it over. And the first thing you're going to look at is this character insanity symbol up here and the number next to it. If your insanity level is less than this number, you don't resolve the card. If your insanity is equal to or higher than this, you check the text on the card and then you resolve the text on the card. In this case, we would deal two light wounds to ourselves. Now you might come across a situation, for example, the pilot's just drawn this sabotage card which says set the item counter to the room you're in to zero. But if we look here, the item counter is already set to zero in the pilot's room. Therefore, she cannot resolve this card. In the situation where you don't resolve the card either because you're not insane enough, so for example, our pilot might be on level one, or you don't resolve the card because you're unable to resolve the text, then your insanity increases. So when you draw a panic card, one of two things happens. Either you cannot resolve the card, either because you're not insane enough, or because you cannot resolve the text for whatever reason, your insanity goes up. However, if your insanity is high enough and you, you can resolve the text on the card, then you do that instead. In this situation here, our pilot has just drawn hallucinations, which is going to cause them to discard all of their ammo. Our soldier doesn't want this to happen, and just so happens to have their interruption card in hand. If a player is ever resolving a panic card, and you're in the room with that player when they're resolving the panic card, you can always discard your interruption card to prevent them from going through with the card. Obviously, it won't be the turn of the player who is interrupting the panicked player. So, in this case, the soldier interrupts the pilot's turn to stop them resolving the panic card. And in this case, no insanity is gained and the card is discarded without being resolved. There are some pretty nasty panic cards in the deck, so you do want to be careful about making sure your insanity is not at a high level. So there's really just one last thing I want to discuss with you in relation to the Void Seeders, 
which is the end game. You've managed to escape. You got out. Congratulations. But you might have taken some contamination en route. Now, the Void Seeders do, of course, still use the contamination. And as we know, when you escape from the Nemesis, you have to do a contamination check. So there are two steps to doing the end game contamination check with the Void Seeders. And the first thing we're going to do is check your insanity level. If your insanity level is at five, you can skip straight to step two. If it's not at five, then we're going to do step one. Step one is take all of your action cards and search your entire deck. Now this includes your hand and your discard pile. Put it all together and search it. If you have any contamination cards in your deck, then increase your insanity by one per contamination card in your deck. So in this case, our soldier doesn't have any contamination cards. They're not at insanity level five, so they're fine. In this case, our soldier has one contamination card. They're on insanity level three, so they have to go up to four. They go up one step per contamination card in the deck. They're not at insanity level five. They're still fine. In step one of this process, what you're going to be doing is ticking up your insanity by one for every contamination card left over in your deck. So our soldier here in this example has two contaminations. They're on insanity level four, so they're going to go up to five and then they'll just stop. Even though they would have to tick up one more step, in the end game, what we're going to do is we're just going to keep going until we reach five and then stop. Any excess steps that you would have to go up for contamination cards are ignored. So unlike during the regular game where you would die if you had to go up one more step, but you were at five, in the end game, we're just going to see if we get to five or not. If you reach five or you started at five, then you have to go into step two, which is shuffle your deck with all your contamination cards in there and we're going to draw cards from the top of our deck just like in the base game and if we get any contamination cards we're going to die so we're going to draw four cards off the top of our action deck we know that in this example the soldier has two so there's a fairly good chance he'll survive two three four a close call so anyone who's got insanity level five has to do this check. You draw four cards, and if you get any of your contamination cards in those four, you're dead. And it doesn't matter, of course, whether or not those contamination cards are infected or not. I mean, you could argue that uh, you didn't actually die. You went irrevocably mad, but that's, that's still considered a loss. And so that's it for the Void Seeders. I hope that's given you everything you need to know in order to play with the Void Seeders in your game at home. But I promised I would talk about the turrets, so let's move on to turrets. Aftermath. The Aftermath expansion is, as you can see here, one of the main two parts of the stretch goals that come in the stretch goal box. The other part being the Void Seeders, which we've just finished talking about. Now, I would love to go into the whole Aftermath expansion and talk about everything that's included in Aftermath, but I just don't have time in this video. So maybe we'll do another video about that. Who knows what the future holds? But if you don't know what Aftermath is, here's a brief summary. Aftermath is a bunch of extra rooms, some more exploration tokens, a bunch of new cards, character traits, which are essentially unique abilities for each character in the game, including a bunch of new characters that come in Aftermath, as well as all the characters from the base game. And it's also two entirely new game modes and a board for one of the game modes. You can play Aftermath as an entirely new two plus hour game called Research Mission. And what that does is it adds a bunch of additional mechanics and it replaces some of the components from the base game with new components for variety. You can also play Aftermath as a shorter roughly one hour game called Epilogue, which is a separate game that you play after a Nemesis base game. So you'll play the whole Nemesis game and then you'll play the Epilogue after, which is about an hour long. And that will change based on what happened in the Nemesis game that you've just played. But a lot of the extra stuff that you get in Aftermath is modular, and so you can incorporate it into the Nemesis base game for variety. 
although the designers point out that this is optional, and so your results for incorporating these modular things may vary. With that in mind, turrets is a thing that they, they included in Aftermath, and it's an optional module, and we're going to talk about the rules for turrets now. So you will find in your Nemesis Stretch Goals box three turret miniatures, three turret exploration tokens, and nine turret status counters in three different colors. And also one turret's control room, which is a level two room. So how you choose to set up the turrets in your game is actually a bit modular. And obviously, because it involves exploration tokens and the Void Seeders have those as well, there's a little bit of exploration token construction as well. So if you want to go with complete randomness in how you set up the turrets, what you can do is uh, if you're setting up the base game, so with the regular intruders, you can just shuffle this in with your level two rooms and uh, just deal those out. Maybe the turret control room will be in the game. Maybe it won't. You can still play with the turrets. You don't need the turret control room to be in the game. Then you can take the three turret exploration tokens and just shuffle those in with the other 20 tokens. And maybe a turret will be in the game. Maybe it won't be. Maybe all three will be in the game. Maybe none of them will be. If you want to make sure that the turrets are in the game, then what you can do is you can shuffle in the three tokens with 13 other random exploration tokens and put them out and then you'll be sure that those three are in the game. So it's really up to you how much you want to put the turrets into the regular game. Just remember that if you're playing with the Void Seeders, you need the three layer tokens to be in the game. So what you could do is you could shuffle in the three turret tokens with the 20 regular tokens and then take 13 at random and add the three layer tokens for the Void Seeders to those 13 to make a total of 16, which may or may not have any turrets in. If you want to make sure you get the three turrets in and the three layers in, then you take those six exploration tokens and add 10 from the base game. So how you kind of orchestrate this is really kind of up to you based on how much randomization you want and how much you want to know about the setup of the game. And so then, of course, you can still decide how you're going to put this level two room into the Void Seeder game in just the same way as you would the setup as well. Just remember that we took the slime room out and we can put the turret control room in. All the turret control room does is change the status of the turrets, which is not necessarily essential to having the turrets in the game. So another way for you to incorporate the turrets in with the Void Seeder tokens is basically just shuffle all together. So you basically have 26 exploration tokens. You put out 16 on the board. You keep the 10 that you're not using to one side. And if you find that you've gotten to the point where there are three rooms left unexplored on the board and none of the Void Cedar layers have come out yet, just make sure that when you explore one of the final three rooms, if it's not a layer, discard the exploration token on it, find the exploration token with the layer on it from the ones you didn't use and put it out. So those final three rooms need to be layers because you have to have the three Void Seeder layers in the game. Otherwise the Void Seeder expansion doesn't work. So that's from the FAQ. If you're using the turrets for setup, just make sure you put the miniatures beside the board and you can take the three status tokens, one of each color, shuffle them up, and put them with each turret like that. So now we've talked about setup, let's talk about the gameplay. So when you explore a new room and you reveal a turret exploration token, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reveal the room, we can set it to the correct number of items, and then we're gonna take one of our turret miniatures there and put it down in the room. Note that this doesn't count as a miniature for the purposes of noise, so you're still going to have to roll for noise having entered the room. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take those three status tokens that we shuffled earlier and we're going to put them in the room with the turret and we're going to flip over the top one to reveal the turret status. Luckily for our soldier boy here, this turret is inactive. So we've got, if you remember from 
the component look, we've got three different statuses that turrets can have. We've got green, which is inactive, turrets do nothing, and also they can't be destroyed. We've got yellow, which is target intruders, these only shoot at aliens. And we've got red, which is target all, which shoots everybody. Based on the turret status, it will shoot at applicable targets that enter the room. And, if applicable, this includes any intruders or void seeders that spawn into the room as the result of an encounter. A turret with the appropriate status will immediately shoot a target that enters the room. It will also, again, attack applicable targets in the fire damage step of the event phase. And note that if there's no fire on the board, typically you skip the fire damage step of the event phase, but if there's an angry turret on the board with one of these aggressive statuses, that turret will shoot in the fire damage step of the event phase. So this means if our soldier had entered this room and the turret happened to be on the target all step, it would have shot at that soldier there. And what happens when a turret shoots you? Well, if you're a player, you take one light wound. Womp womp. If it's an intruder, or a Void Seeder in this case, the Void Seeder takes an injury, and then we immediately check to see what happens. Well, in this case, nothing. Turrets can be destroyed. Our soldier can use the demolition card here to blow up this turret. In this case, the turret's just removed, along with its status markers. Intruders and Void Seeders also hate turrets. Even though they're weird hallucinations, they can still destroy turrets, or maybe they just drive you mad and you destroy the turret. But if a turret has one of the statuses that causes it to attack intruders or void seeders in the fire damage step, then it will simultaneously be destroyed by the intruder. So if we're on target all in this example, it will deal one damage to the intruder, one light wound to the player, and then the intruder or void seeder will destroy it. And this happens simultaneously, so it does one wound to the Void Seeder, which may well kill the Void Seeder, but the Void Seeder simultaneously destroys the turret. The last thing to talk about on turrets is the turret control room. That just controls turrets. So if you're in here, you can take an action for two cards, and that allows you to change the status of any turrets on the board. And that's it for turrets, which also means that's it for this video. And I'll be back tomorrow with Chris, Michael, and Ollie to see if we can survive a Void Cedar incursion. This video and this series wouldn't happen without the support of my backers on Patreon. So a big thank you to them for making this series happen. And if you found this video helpful, or if you enjoy this series, or if you want to have a say in what we cover on the channel, be sure to check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash readysteadyplay. But I hope you found this instructional video helpful and that you'll come back tomorrow to join me and my buddies for our nemesis escapade. So I'll see you tomorrow and thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.